Thank you all for coming, and please be seated. Uh, there is a significant handout for this lecture, <laughs> which I think may maybe we have uh, not enough for everybody to have one. So please do share or look over at people's shoulders. It will help at least with many things I'm going to do because I'm going to try to talk my way through a lot of proofs uh, just to give you some sense of all the things that are in the optics. Okay. Euclid presents the reader with proofs about eyes and what they see. He gives, he gives us proofs about the height of trees and the depth of ditches. And some parts of the proofs that he gives us are sunlight, shadows, mirrors, and chariot wheels. Euclid offers comments about natural beings that move and grow. And he offers comments that are phenomenological. He even offers comments about the workings of the human mind. But this Euclid of whom I'm now speaking is not the writer and thinker that many of you think or may think you know. The Euclid of whom I am speaking is the author of the work known as the optics. This Euclid can be found just a few inches farther along a bookshelf of a well-stocked library from the Euclid of the Elements. And the tradition that passes both works down to us tells us that the author of both works is the same. Yet the Euclid of the Optics does not seem to think the same things that I've heard many students of the Euclid of the Elements claim about that author. One of the most striking and persistent claims that I've heard is that in the, ele that in the Elements, Euclid is not making any claims about the real world. The Euclid of the Optics does not seem to think straight lines or other geometrical figures possessing similar degrees of perfection are not part of the real world. Rather, this Euclid seems to think our power of perception to be inadequate to the perfections of the beings that are in principle perceptible. This Euclid does not seem to present mathematics as a bunch of made up things. Rather, he presents human beings as beings that make up some part of their experiences in order to compensate for deficiencies of our powers of perception in some cases, and in order to avoid the unsettling consequences of purer or more honest perceiving on the other, in other cases. If we trust that what has been left to us as Euclid's work is the work of the same author, then we must find a way to understand this other Euclid, as the same human being as the one with, with which we feel familiar. We're aided in this effort and our trust is bolstered by the fact that so much of the geometry we find in the optics resembles in presentation and method and assumptions the geometry of the elements. Part one, Horoi. The beginning of the work should certainly give us a sense of the familiar. Just as he does in the elements, Euclid begins his optics with a set of horoi, or boundaries, a term which usually gets translated as and referred to as definitions. For his optics, Euclid only states seven of these horoi, but we should probably not regard these stated definitions as the only definitions of the optics. The proofs in the optics presuppose, in the background, a geometry that must be much like that found in the elements. I say much like because the order of composition is unclear, and some tradition exists that regards the optics as an earlier work. The horoi of the optics seem to augment the horoi of the elements by stating the geometrical character of selected aspects of sight. The seven horoi read in the Greek as one long connected sentence. And I want to caution you not to be too quick to think of them as assumptions or presuppositions. They may very well show themselves in the course of this lecture to be conclusions or even to be one complex conclusion. Now these are the seven horoi of Euclid's optics as they're found in the only published translation in English, 
that of Harry Edward Burton, which is published in May 1945 in an edition of the Journal of the Optical Society of America. I've made some changes <laughs> to the translation based upon my own consultation of the Greek original. One, let it be assumed that lines drawn straight from the eye carry through a space of great extent. Two, and that the figure of the space included within our vision is a cone with its apex at the eye and its base at the extremities of the thing seen. Three, and that those things upon which the rays of vision fall are seen, and those things upon which the rays of vision do not fall are not seen. Four, and that those things seen within a larger angle appear larger, and those seen within a smaller angle appear smaller and those seen within equal angles appear to be of the same size. Five, and that things seen within the higher visual range appear higher, while those within the lower range appear lower. Six, and similarly, that those seen within the visual range of the right appear on the right while those within that on the left appear on the left. Seven, but that things seen within more angles appear to be more clear. Now I'll try to offer a few thoughts on these definitions. The first definition does not come out of nowhere. It is perhaps the most familiar and least noted aspect of our vision. Vision occurs for us through a distance. But Euclid says more than just that in his first definition. Euclid says our vision carries through a great greatness, a megathon megalon. Why does he think this? We ourselves think vision occurs through a distance because we, need, we tend to think of ourselves and the place of ourselves as bound up within the confines of our own body's extension. Thus we note that vision shows us things to which we need to reach out in order to make contact with them. Or we need to move our whole body for some time in order to get over near the things we have seen from afar. But even this does not exhaust our sense that vision carries through distance. For we can see things that we can never move to or are never able to move to. And interact with in the kind of way we do with extra, visu extra visual means. That is, we could see stars and we can conclude from the way that they behave in our vision, as Ptolemy concluded, that they must be very far away. In this first definition, Euclid also seems to think that our power of vision operates along straight lines. Now, why does he think that? Perhaps it may boil down to things like the way opaque objects can block our vision of things behind them, or the fact that we cannot see the back of our own head, that convince Euclid that the power of sight operates along straight lines. But if that's so, it seems clear we cannot derive our notion of straightness here from the testimony of our sense of sight without being tautological. And so I would say here, just as in the elements, we must already have a grasp of what straightness is in order to understand the definitions that involve straightness. Now, since there's no limit in principle to how far a straight line may be extended in space, the first definition does not announce a limit built into the power of our vision as to how far we can see. Note again, we can see stars, and their distance from us, as Ptolemy has it, is so great that their remoteness functions for us as an actual infinity. But this first definition does, one, does have one more element. We see with our eyes. Straight lines striking other parts of our body do not produce vision. And this constitutes a kind of limit on our vision. 
The second definition points out that our vision is limited in another way, and that it does not extend in all directions at once. Rather, it takes on the spatial form of a cone. This may be thought of as a conical array of divergent straight lines emanating from the point of our eye. The cone may not have a mere single point as its vertex. It could have all the points of the seen surface of the eye as the vertex, and especially at large distances, all the proofs that Euclid offers would cl be close approximations. But maybe thinking about the eye as one point is a way to think about the unity of visual perception and to avoid asking how do all those points interact. The third definition states that seeing only occurs within the geometrical limits of our power of sight. Only what is within the cone of our vision and is addressed by the rays of our vision is actually seen. The fourth definition defines what size is for vision. For vision, the size of a seen object is the size of the angle or portion of the total cone within which it is seen. With this definition, appearance enters into the optics as a theme. The word appear in this definition is the explicit sign of this. The fifth and sixth definitions define what ordinal location is for vision. Whether an object is seen as left or right, above or below, is defined by the region of the cone of vision in which the object is seen. The seventh definition states that our vision of objects has variable clarity and that those objects seen within more angles are more clear. Now another way to say this is that those objects addressed by more seats of the power of vision or more visual rays, assuming the rays diverge uniformly, are seen more clearly. Now with these definitions understood in these ways, the reader is in a position to make diagrams representing a great variety of situations to which the seeing eye and its visual power may be subject. Moreover, the reader is in a position to interpret diagrams or merely logically constructed scenarios in such a way as to, to determine what vision does and does not do, what it can and cannot do. So let us now turn to looking at a selection of some of the propositions that Euclid is able to carry out on the basis of the horoi with which he begins. Part two, phenomena. Many of Euclid's proofs in the optics might be said to fall into the category of saving the appearances. That is, many of the proofs show how the geometry of what is out there in the world can give rise to the appearances that constitute the geometry of visual appearance. Two worlds are at play and often in conflict in all the proofs. There is the world of what is and the world of what is seen. These worlds are never the same. In the very first proposition of the book, Euclid sets out to prove that Quote, this is the enunciation, nothing that is seen is seen at once in its entirety. This is labeled Proposition 1 on your handout. The diagram on your page represents a single eye, and I should point out many of the proofs limit themselves to what is seen by a single eye. A single eye at the vertex of many straight lines representing the power of sight. In this diagram, I have labeled the eye with the full name I. In every subsequent diagram, I have simply labeled eyes with the letter E. The straight line on that diagram, AG, represents some side or dimension of an object being seen. The basis of Euclid's proof is very easy to see from the diagram itself. There are parts of the line AG that are not touched by the lines representing the power of sight. All the parts between A and B, B and C, C and D, D and E, E and F, and F and G. 
Now, according to the third definition, nothing that is not addressed by the power of sight is seen. So none of those parts between the lines are seen. Thus, at any one time, it's hama in Greek, some parts of the object will not be seen. Which is to say, for vision, there's no reading between the lines. That is really, that is really the entirety of Euclid's proof, the first proof. And one, I think, can readily see from the diagram itself that Euclid's claim must be so. But what makes Euclid sure that there are gaps between the lines of sight? It seems to be a necessary conclusion from the starting point of the first definition. If our power of vision operates along straight lines, and if that power is comprised of more than one straight line, then the straight lines starting from the eye and being distinct from one another must diverge. And if the straight lines diverge, then at any distance from the eye itself, there must be gaps between the lines of sight that leave regions that are unaddressed by the power of sight. The straightness of our power of vision necessitates that at any one time our seeing of an object must be partial. Now, after proving this, Euclid adds one sentence to his account that is not properly part of the proof at all. He says, quote, but it seems to be seen all at once because the rays of vision shift rapidly. This little comment tacked on at the end may be the most interesting sentence of the entire work. This sentence raises the specter of a kind of experience humans seem, it says doke, to have that is neither quite the seeming finest eye of what our power of sight gives us, nor is it the underlying truth of the pure geometry. Euclid claims that some kind of rapid sweeping or flickering motion of the eyes, carrying with them the straight lines of vision's power, makes the power of vision address enough of the parts of an object that it seems to us to be seen in its entirety all at once. Now, what kind of phenomenon is this seeming that gives us the sense that we see whole objects all at once? Or which is genuinely phenomenal? The logically necessary phenomenon saved in the proof that results in the conclusion that we do not see any object in its entirety all at once. Or the phenomenon that seems to appear to us because of the rapid shifting of the rays of vision. I will return later to this perplexing and pregnant one sentence note of Euclid's. I just want to call attention to it here because it seems to light up the way in which the givens or the starting points of this whole investigation raise questions about where we really start as human beings and what we really experience. Some of these questions are carried over into the second proposition of the book. The diagram is on your handout, labeled, strangely enough, Proposition 2. You can see from the parenthesis that the very same diagram can and will be used for Proposition 5. Now, Proposition 2 claims, quote, objects located nearby are seen more clearly than objects of equal size located at a distance. Just look at the diagram. Objects A, B, and C, D are equal in size, in truth, but they are unequally distant from the I, E. Therefore, A, B being closer to E will be seen more clearly than C, D. The proof of this is, again, very evident from the diagram itself, for it's clear that the angle C, E, D is smaller than and contained by the angle A, E, B. Thus, object AB is seen by more angles than the object CD. And according to definition 7, things seen by more angles are seen more clearly. Another and perhaps clearer way to say this is that object CD is addressed by the power of all the lines of sight contained within the angle CED. 
but object AB is addressed by the power of all those lines plus the power of those extra lines of sight contained within the angle AEB, but outside of the angle CED. Thus, AB being nearer to the eye is seen more clearly. This proof clarifies something about what Euclid says in his little note at the end of Proposition 1. For although the rapid shifting of the lines of sight might, may make it seem to human beings that they see whole objects in their entirety all at once, even with that shifting, there's may, there must still be gaps in what is addressed by the power of vision. For the whole explanation that Euclid gives in Proposition 2 about why equal things seen at unequal distances are seen with different degrees of clarity presupposes gaps or unequal subjection to the power of sight. If the rapid sweeping of the lines of sight truly gave us all the parts of an object, we would see all objects with the same degree of clarity, regardless of distance. Although this proposition comes second in the work, it may be the variable clarity of images that we experience as we see things in the world is really a more fundamental and decisive kind of partialness than the partialness that Euclid presents to us in Proposition 1. Our experience of differing clarities in our vision may have given Euclid a firmer phenomenological reason to adopt the opinion that our power of vision is constituted by many separate and divergent lines of sight, rather than one line rapidly and continuously sweeping over all that we see. Now, such a single line of visual power, sweeping continuously over objects and leaving no unaddressed gaps, would also make the next proposition impossible. Proposition 3 claims, quote, every object has a certain limit of distance, and when this is reached, it is seen no longer. The proof of this claim, again, can be seen easily from the diagram. If line EA and line EB are divergent lines of sight between which there is no other line of visual power, then the object AB is located at the very limit of its visibility when its extremities just lie upon the lines EA and EB. An object of equal size, such as C, and situated further, farther away, will fall between the lines of visual power, and thus will not be seen at all. Thus, anything of any size has a limit past which distance it cannot be seen. This limit is determined by the relationship between the size of the object and the angular divergence of the straight lines that carry the power of sight. The size of stars must be very big, and the divergence of the lines of sight must be very small in order for us to see them at such great distances. Still, the size of the gaps in our power of sight is significant even at terrestrial distances. Now, this proposition seems also, to be impl also implicitly to be making the claim that an object that is addressed by only one line of sight at a time will not be seen. This may be because one line of sight may not give us enough to be noticeable. But that really begs the question about exactly how much is enough to be noticeable. Also, the proposition seems to treat being touched by two lines of sight as enough for sight. But why should two lines give enough when one does not? This question, I think, becomes even more pressing the more one takes Euclid literally to be claiming that the power of sight travels along straight lines. What can travel along a, along a line when a line is understood to be a breathless length? I think the only meaningful answer seems to be points. But can we compose the scope and extent of the images we think we see out of points that being partless themselves would seem incapable of conveying the parts of images. We might be tempted to think that if we're going to be capable of seeing anything, we're going to have to be less literal in our understanding of Euclid's words. 
Is it possible that he understands the lines of sight to have some breadth? I've provided an image of one such fat line or breadth length on your handout. This, that image does not correspond to anything explicit in Euclid's text. As you can see from the diagram, such fat lines are, of course, rectangles. Now, if the power of vision does operate through many long, thin rectangles, it would operate in many ways as if it operated along straight lines. However, Proposition 3 would not be strictly true. For objects smaller in size than the fat lines, there would be no disappearing point. The whole of one of their sides would be addressed by a single line of vision that would continue to address the object regardless of its distance. The clarity of such a small object for vision based on, on fat lines would also not vary according to its distance, since only one line would address the object at any distance. Thus, Proposition 2 also would not hold. Also, Proposition 1 would collapse. For the entirety of such a small object would be seen all at once by one fat line of sight. Now, this thought reveals that the entirety spoken of in the Proposition 1 is only the entirety of one side of the object. The question of the other sides of the object, say, the question of the other sides of the ob object is addressed in numerous later proofs dealing with the power of two eyes together and depends upon the shape and size of the object and the location of the eyes and the distance between the eyes. You might look at propositions 23 through 33. They're not all there. I'll talk about a couple of them later. However, it might be that in such an imagined case as I'm presenting to you, as that of the fat lines, I would have to say that all sides or surfaces of the object would be seen all at once. Since in enveloping the small object, the fat line touches all of its sides. And what is touched by the power of sight is seen. Now the next proposition I want to show you also would not work for such fat lines. In Proposition 5, Diagram 2, or pro right? Euclid claims, quote, objects of equal size, unequally distant, appear unequal, and the one lying nearer to the eye always appears larger. As I mentioned earlier for this proposition, you can use the diagram for Proposition 2. Now, now according to Definition 4, things seen within a larger angle will appear larger. Thus, of two equal objects unequally distant from the eye, E, the nearer object, AB, will appear larger because it is seen within the larger angle, AEB. Proposition 5 also means that for vision, the size of an object will change when the eye changes its distance from the object. And Proposition 3 also means that for vision, Objects cease to exist at certain distances. And Proposition 2 also means that for vision, objects become more or less distinct in their form as an eye changes its distance from them. And Proposition 1 also means that without some modification, some flickering or shifting of the eye, and some power of retaining the images of many moments and of putting them together, vision does not give us an experience of wholes. Thus, the phenomena of sight, as Euclid presents them to the reader in the opening proposition, seem to give us something unlike the world we usually assume we inhabit. If we focus just on what the power of sight gives us, then the world we see is not made up of things that are natural wholes. If we allow ourselves the luxury of some rapid shifting to obscure that for us, then we still encounter things, things of sight that change their own clarity or distinctness of form because our eyes change location. The things also pass out of visual existence 
and come into visual existence because of the location and power of our eyes. Things also change their size when we move toward or away from them, or they move toward or away from us. For vision, it could even be said that objects do not have a size of their own, apart from their relation to the location of our eyes. Objects are also seen to have different shapes depending upon the location of our eyes. Now here are some examples. Take a look at the ceiling. You might notice how the parts of the ceiling that are farther away from you occupy a lower portion of your visual cone than those parts nearer to being directly over your heads. Thus, the ceiling appears to slope downward. This is shown by Euclid in Proposition 14. Similarly, the floor slopes upward. The parts that are farther away from you appear in a higher part of your visual range. And this is shown by Euclid in Proposition 13. Now, on the basis of the same principles, the parts of the walls that are farther away appear to be closing in. You would notice this especially in a long hallway. This is shown in Proposition 6 by Euclid, which is merely an application of what we just looked at, that is, what he proved in Proposition 5. Now, what I've just talked about is, I, I want to say, it is what the room looks like and we usually do not notice it. But when we apply our attention, we do see this. We see that it is what we see. Now here's some more examples from the optics about how objects change their shape. Proposition 9 shows that rectangular objects seen from a distance will appear to have rounded corners. This is because their sharp corners disappear into the gaps of our vision. Now, Proposition 22 shows that curved lines will appear straight when viewed by an eye that is in the same plane as the curved lines. Proposition 36 shows that at some distances and some angular orientations, the wheels of chariots will not appear circular. And this proposition seems to relate to how Euclid thought about ellipses. Proposition 58 shows how under some circumstances, squares do not look like squares. Thus, the world as it seems to be given to us by our sense of sight is filled with things that seem to have few stable properties of their own, independent of us. In all these proofs, Euclid presents the changeable, unstable world given to us by sight as merely apparent. However, the true underlying world of pure geometry where things have their own size and shape and granular distinctness and tend to keep them regardless of how or where we move our eyes seems to have become a much more prominent theme in the later propositions of the optics. Part three, the underlying truth. The difference between these two worlds is a very prominent theme in this next proof I wish to show you. And this proof will likely be the hardest to follow of all that I, I have tonight. It's really because it relies on a greater number of assumptions of previous proofs that are not in the optics, and because it involves some manipulation of ratios. Proposition 8 qu claims Quote, lines of equal length and parallel, if placed at unequal distances from the eye, are not seen in proportion to the distances. Now this proposition could also be treated as addressing the proportional change in apparent size of one object that changes its distance from the eye. Here the two worlds that I've been talking about come starkly apart because the two worlds do not share a ratio. That is, they do not share a logos. They are literally in the Greek text, ouk analogos. This happens in part 
because size for the world of vision is dependent upon angles, and size for the world of pure geometry is measured linearly. Now let's take a stab at proving Proposition 8. I think you may be encouraged by the fact that many of you have seen this proof, likely without knowing it, in the work of Ptolemy. Both a part of the diagram of this proof and the heart of its reasoning is used in what is called Lemma 1.2 of the Green Lion edition of the Almagest, that's Mr. Perry's translation, starting at the bottom of page 43, which is also Heiberg's for page 43. So you've done it before, and that means the proof is not really that bad, just less easy than some others. All right, so if you look at that diagram, what we need to prove is that angle CEA does not have to angle DEF the same ratio as line FE has to line AE. That is, it does not ever have the same ratio. So angle CEA is the visual size of object CA. And angle DEF is the visual size of object DF. If visual size were simply dependent upon distance from the eye, then angle CEA would have to angle DEF the same ratio as line FE has to line AE. However, if you draw in the circular arc GBH, through point B with center E, then we see the following. Triangle EBC is bigger than sector EBH because the triangle contains the sector. Uh, just in case you don't know, a sector is a portion of a circle bo bounded by the angle from the center. Okay. So now that we know what a sector is, if you look at triangle EAB, you'll see that it's smaller than sector EGB because there the sector contains the triangle. Thus triangle EBC has to sector EBH a larger ratio than the triangle EAB has to sector EGB. Now if you take the alternate ratio which Euclid proves we can do in his elements. This means triangle, triangle EBC has to triangle EAB, a greater ratio than sector EBH has to sector EGB. You will see this if you remember, triangle EBC is bigger than sector EBH, and triangle EAB is smaller than sector EGB. Thus, the ratio of the triangle that is bigger than its respective sector to the triangle that is smaller than its respective sector is greater than the ratio of the sector that the sectors have to each other. Now the ratio of sector EBH to sector EGB is the same as the ratios of the angle CEB to angle DEF because sectors of a circle are proportional to the angles at the center of the circle that contains them. Now we need to manipulate one more ratio. It is a consequence of what we've already shown, that the combined triangle EAC, made up from triangle EBC and triangle EAB, has to its part triangle EAB, a greater ratio than the combined sector EGH has to its part EGB. Now triangle EAC has to triangle EAB the same ratio as the ratio of their corresponding sides, that's line AC and line AB, have to each other. And since the line AC is equal in length to line FD, triangle EAC has to triangle EAB the same ratio as the line FD has to line AB. And line FD has to line AB the same ratio as line FE has to line AE, since both pairs of lines are respectively the sides of similar triangles. FE is the distance from the eye to object FD, and AE is the distance from the eye to object AC. And this ratio of distance FE to distance AE is, 
being proven the same as the ratio of triangle EAC to triangle EAB, and therefore necessarily greater than the ratio of the sector EGH to the sector EGB. But those sectors had the same ratio as the angles CEA and DEF. And those angles are the sizes of the objects for vision. Thus, the apparent size of the objects for vision, or sizes, I'm sorry, the apparent sizes of the objects for vision are not in proportion to the true geometric distances of the objects from the eye. Now, <laughs> I hope you had some chance of following what I just went through. Uh, you, can, you have the diagram and you can go over it again if you ever need to. But regardless of how clear I've been able to make the proof of this proposition for you, I want you to see a consequence of this proof. Size has a different and somewhat independent meaning in the visual world, world of appearance than it has in the true, true world of pure geometry. Size in the visual world depends upon angular measure only. Right? Now, of course, angles and their measure have their own meaning in the world of pure geometry. But that meaning there does not determine the size of things other than that of the angles themselves. Now, despite this separation of the logoi of the two worlds, Euclid does present a series of proofs that show how the appearance of the visual world can be used to calculate the true size of unknown but seen objects. You'll see these on your handout in the trio of diagrams labeled Propositions 18, 19, and 21. All of these propositions operate by coming to know the true size somehow, perhaps by measurement with some standard physical measuring device of three links, and then finding a fourth proportional. In proposition 18, if you want to know the height of an unknown object DC when the sun is shining and casting a shadow of that object, then all you need to do is situate your eye on the ground at the extremity of the shadow and interpose a known object, AB, oriented perpendicular to the shadow on the ground into the shadow until it is placed at that point just where the height of the known object is wholly but just within the shadow. Since you already know the length of AB and you can come to know by measuring the distance EA from the eye to AB, and the distance EC from the I to DC. And since EA has to AB the same ratio as EC has to the unknown, DC, all you need to do is calculate the fourth proportional. Proposition 19 enables one to find an unknown height when the sun is not shining. And it does so in such a manner, and, or at least not shining in such a manner as to be able to cast a usable shadow. Now, in that proposition, a standing man identifies that point in a mirror placed at ground level at which the upper extremity of the unknown object's image appears. That unknown object there on that diagram is DC again. Because as Euclid knows, the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection at the mirror, Similar triangles are formed by the standing man and the unknown object and the mirror image. Once again, one need only measure the three lengths, the height of the man's eye, the distance from the man's foot to the top of the image in the mirror, and the distance from the top of the image in the mirror to the base of the unknown object. After that, one need only calculate the fourth proportional to find the height of the unknown object. Now, Proposition 21 might be even more general and simpler. In order to find the length of an unknown object, CD, one merely needs to move a known object, AB, into the angle in which CD is seen until the extremities of AB just exactly block your sight of the extremities of CD. Then one merely needs to find the measure of distances, EA and EC, and, once again, and one is once again in a position to find the fourth proportional. Thus, by means of the appearances of the visual world, Euclid shows that he can calculate 
the true geometric size of an unknown but seen object. Now these proofs are followed by another set of proofs that show vision to be partial or incomplete in a manner different from the, par from the partiality presented in Proposition 1 and in Proposition 2. These proofs also continue to show a divide between the visual world and the true world. For these proofs all maintain that there is more to a seen object than those portions or sides that are or can be addressed by the power of vision. And this too raises a question about whence we acquire our notions of wholeness and also a question about what kind of notions those are. Proposition 23 considers what happens when an eye looks at a sphere. The sphere is a good place to start because it would seem, on the basis of its shape, to allow an eye to see more of it at one time than any other shape, or every other shape. The sharp corners of solids bounded by flat surfaces tend to block the vision of eyes that see along straight lines. Despite this seeming promise offered by the shape of the sphere, Proposition 23 claims, quote, of a sphere seen in whatever way by one eye, less than, than a hemisphere is always seen. Now, if you glance at the two-dimensional diagram on, on your handout, you can see why this is so. The straight lines emanating from the eye cannot address any part of the surface of the sphere beyond the points where those straight lines become tangent to the sphere. And those points of tangency always occur before the power of sight can address so much as a hemisphere. For at the hemisphere, the two tangents would both be perpendicular to the same diameter. And that would make a triangle, triangle ABE in that diagram, a triangle whose angles added up to more than two right angles, which cannot be for Euclid. Now propositions 25 through 27 show what you can see when you look at a sphere with two eyes. That is, if you're not a cyclops. I have only given you the diagram for Proposition 25 on your handout. In these propositions, everything depends upon the size of the sphere compared to the distance between the eyes. In Proposition 25, the distance between the eyes is the same as the diameter of the sphere. And in that case, you can see exactly the hemisphere. Proposition 26 considers cases where the distance between the eyes is greater than the diameter of the sphere. It's a small sphere. In such cases for which you can imagine your own diagram, you could see more than the hemisphere, but never quite all of the sphere. And Proposition 27 shows that if the distance between the eyes is less than the diameter of the sphere, then you can only see less than a hemisphere. You may as well be a cyclops then. Thus, if the visual world and its possibilities is based upon a being whose power of vision is limited to only two eyes, the objects of the true geometric world will always be keeping something hidden from the power of vision. Now next, I want to just show you a proposition, the enunciation of which begins like a fairy tale, and the content of which behaves like a kind of magical charm. Euclid begins Proposition 38, Estitis Topos, there is some place. It's like a children's tale about a special region in space that has its own special properties. Here's the quote. There's some place where, if the position of the eye is changed while the thing seen remains in the same place, the thing seen always appears of the same size. Unlike what happens elsewhere, when the eye moves around within this special place, the visual size of the object does not change. Now you have the diagram for Proposition 38 on your handout. If AB is the seen object, then AB looks the same size as seen from E1 or E2 or E3. Or, for, or from anywhere else along that curve. This is because the curve is the arc of a circle cut off by the chord AB. Since all the angles in a segment of a circle are the same in measure, an eye placed along the arc of the circumference 
and looking at the cord that cuts off the circumference will always see the cord within the same angle. And the same angle means the same size. While the linear distance from the eye to the cord will vary along the arc, the visual size of the cord will not vary. And this means that visual size does not depend simply on linear distance. Now this proof that does not seem to establish that objects viewed from some such special places will have parts that all appear with the same degree of clarity, however. Visual clarity seems to depend not so much on how many rays of vision touch an object as on how large the gaps are between the rays, but the divergence of the rays seems to depend on distance alone. And so in this way, the visual clarity of an object does seem to depend upon distance alone. That means visual size and visual clarity have themselves somewhat different logoi. Now Euclid makes a very clever extension of what is shown in Proposition 38 to show in Proposition 45 that there is a place where the eye can be located to make two objects of different true sizes appear to have the same size to the eye. The diagram for Proposition 45, again, is on your handout. If two objects of unequal size are arranged in a straight line, there is a place from which the two objects will look equal to the eye. Euclid finds this special place just by extending the principle shown in Proposition 38. If one constructs on each of the two objects similar arcs cut off by the objects as cords, with the stipulation that the arcs are greater than semicircles, this ensures that they will intersect, an eye placed at the intersection of the two arcs will see the unequal objects to have the same size. And again, this is because the angles in similar segments are equal. So equal angles means the same visual size. And once again, Euclid continues the theme that what vision gives us is not the truth although the givens of vision can be accounted for by the underlying geometrical truths, and, the, and what ge appears to us in, as vision can be thought backwards to try to figure out the geometrical truths. Now in Proposition 51, Euclid throws in a proof about relative motion, perhaps to show us that not only does vision deceive us about size and shape, but also about locomotion. The scenario for this proof is that three objects, A, B, and C, are all moving in the same direction, but at different speeds. The eye is also moving in the same direction, and with the same, object, uh, same speed as the middle object, B. Object A is moving more slowly, and object C is moving more swiftly. Euclid claims that the object moving with the same speed as the eye will seem to stand still. Others moving more slowly will seem to move in the opposite direction, and others moving more quickly will seem to move ahead. The diagram for this proposition may not seem to be very helpful, but if you try to use your imagination to imbue the diagram with change over time, I think Euclid's proof will readily appear. With the objects and the eye moving according to their assigned speeds, the eye and object B, moving faster than A, will leave A behind. And angle AEB will widen. A will thus appear in a part of the eye's visual range that is more left than the part where A started. Being seen in the more left portion of the visual range will look as if it is motion leftward, or as if motion leftward has taken place. And this is a consequence of def definition six. Similarly, object B will seem to stay in the same place within the visual range, and object C will be seen as moving rightward. Thus, the appearances given us by vision will deceive about both what is or is not in motion, and about the way things are in motion. Visual appearance will even deceive us about alteration, as Euclid shows in Propositions 53 and 56. Proposition 53 claims that, quote, when the eye moves nearer the object seen, 
the object will seem to grow larger. The proof of this claim can be seen easily from the diagram on your handout. In moving from E1 to E2, it is clear that the eye comes to see object AB in a larger angle at its second position. If one imagines the whole movement of the eye to be a continuous approach nearer to the object, then the diagram represents the continuous motion analyzed into each moment. Thus, the visual appearance would be one of a continuous getting larger of the object. Such growth or enlargement is the kind of kinesis classically categorized as alteration. Of course, this object is not altered. It just seems so to the moving eye. Now, Proposition 56 complements the scenario of Proposition 53 by claiming, quote, objects increased in size will seem to approach the eye. The actual proof that Euclid offers of this is quite odd. Basically, he says that when the object grows, it will occupy a greater angle of vision. Now, I think that's fine, and it seems geometrically sound within the scheme of the optics. But after that, Euclid seems to offer psychological observations based upon some kind of assumption that we get used to things appearing to get bigger within our cone of vision as they get closer to us. And we acquire thereby a habit of thought that comes to conclude if an object gets bigger to our sight, it is coming toward us. But if we come to think this way, we will not be able to distinguish between alteration and locomotion. Now Euclid's actual words are this, quote, but things thought to be greater than themselves seem to be increased, and the things nearer the eye appear greater. So objects increased in size will seem to approach the eye. Now the word for appear in this passage is phinetai, and the various uses of seem in each case is some version of doke. The two species of phenomena found at the end of Proposition 1 are showing themselves again. And so perhaps then at this point in the optics puts us in a position to return to the promised discussion of Euclid's one sentence note to Proposition 1. Part 4, Commitments. One might have thought that whatever world we inhabit would have to be given to us by what our senses give us. But throughout the optics, Euclid does not treat what sight gives us as a foundation or a starting point. It should be made clear that Euclid does not appear in this text to be correcting sight here by means of the testimony of some other sense, such as hearing or touch. So what then does allow Euclid to push aside the testimony of the sense of sight in favor of a world that differs in its character in many ways? We might approach a beginning of an answer to this question by returning our attention to that one sentence comment Euclid appended to his proof of Proposition 1. Again, but it seems to be seen all at once because the rays of vision shift rapidly. A lot seems to be contained in this brief comment. In order for some rapid shifting of the rays of vision to seem to us to overcome the partial character of our power of vision, a number of things seem to be necessary. We must have other powers. We must have a power of holding on to moments of vision. It's very tempting to call that memory. We must also have a power that allows us to put together those moments into a seeming whole. And it's tempting to call that imagination. Somehow, a series of moments in time must be put together to give the appearance of one human moment of time. And a series of moments of vision that seem to have presented themselves to the eye sequentially must be held onto and put together to give the appearance of the experience of the sight of a visual whole. Euclid leaves a lot here for us to guess at, and there's no way to be sure about the details. We can, however, draw reasonable conclusions about the sort of things that must underlie the thinking present in his one-sentence comment. 
there may be no avoiding the conclusion that Euclid thinks the wholeness of things that seems to us to be part of our experience of sight is really some product of our own making. That is not to say that the wholeness is something wholly made up and does not correspond to any real thing. But it is to say that for Euclid, our experience of wholes is not given to us by our sense of sight, or maybe any other sense. Our experience of wholes is given to us by something we do to what is given us by our senses. Something like memory must hold on to the moments of vision, something like an image-making capacity must synthesize these moments together so that the mind addresses them as one thing. This holding together and putting together must operate according to rules that determine what to put together, what to keep separate, when to start, when to stop. These rules for wholeness cannot be given to us by our partial power of sight, which in its very partiality does not give us the wholes. If I were to call these rules schema, one might be tempted to suppose that what Euclid has in mind is something like the transcendental deduction found in Kant's critique of pure reason, especially in the threefold synthesis of apperception in the first edition. In one little sentence, then, Euclid prefigures Kant. How far might that thought go? Is Euclid already thinking that the wholeness that seems to be available to us in our experience of seeing things and that corresponds to the wholeness Euclid ascribes to the objects in his underlying true geometry is really to be derived from a priori sources such as a formal intuition of space and inborn categories of logical reasoning. The a posteriori option of deriving the underlying true geometry from what sight gives us by means of some abstraction would seem to be ruled out by the following consideration. The term abstraction means most originally in Latin that something that has been cut away from something else. By means of such cutting away, a thing is made lesser, not more. But the experience of wholeness that Euclid presents as seeming to be available to our human awareness of sight is fuller or more than the partialness that his first proposition concludes belongs to our power of sight alone. Thus, abstraction, which makes things ever lesser, cannot be the way to get to the fuller objects that populate Euclid's supposed world of pure geometry. Now, in his transcendental deduction, Kant describes a series of happenings or events that occur below the threshold of human experience or awareness. Perception gives us something, a manifold, but something must be done to that given in order to make it capable of being experienced. The manifold given us by perception must be made more thought-like or concept-like before we can be aware of it, before we can think it. Euclid's little sentence at the end of the first proposition seems to indicate our experience of sight, the way sight seems to us, involves a wholeness that is more than what the power of sight itself can logically be concluded to give us. Euclid also seems to think that such wholeness belongs properly to the world underlying the world revealed by our senses. It may be that our thinking experience, our awareness, is necessarily shaped gives me a chance. It may be that our thinking experience, our awareness, is necessarily shaped by the inborn givens of some kind of a priori nature. But why commit one's thought to the additional conclusion that the true world must correspond to our way of thinking as well? For Euclid, the world of visible objects seems to be something like seeable space. All the seeables are continuous magnitudes. Continuity means there is potentially infinite divisibility, and a power of sight that operates along straight lines makes many divisions. But if its job is to see all that there is, that job can never be finished. 
If we think back to Proposition 3, it seems we need more than one ray of vision to touch an object in order to have some sight of it. Seeing more than one point, then, seems to engage our, pro our process for making up a whole. It may be that this process should be thought of as filling in, for we seem to make our, experiences of, our experience of holes by filling in the gaps not given to us by vision. This filling in process must in this account be guided by or disciplined by whatever points we do see. The more points, the more guidance. But even with many points given us by vision, what we make up to fill in the gaps is never as clear as what is given us by sight. This may mean something for what we think about perceived reality, and perhaps for what we think about madness. In presenting the pure geometry of his, of his proofs as the underlying truth beneath the appearance of vision, Euclid seems to commit to more than Kant does. Euclid seems to be claiming to know how things are in themselves. One might say that Euclid's real geometrical beings are not Kant's inaccessible things in themselves, but they are never wholly accessed. Now, why would Euclid make such a claim that extends to the, the real world that we don't simply have access to? It's not intrinsically crazy, for instance, or inconsistent to say that things in the world change their sizes and shapes, that they sometimes become less distinct in their forms, that they sometimes pass out of existence. But most people think it is crazy to think that simply because one person's eye changes location, all the other things in the world would suffer changes. That is to say, I would venture a guess that it's because of a concern with causality that Euclid rejects the testimony of the power of sight and concludes that the things in the world must be more stable and independent of one another, just as they are in his pure geometry. Euclid's interest in causality in the optics is evident in all the proofs about relative motion, wherein he attributes the appearances to the motion of the viewing eye but does not present the movement of the eye as causing any real change in anything other than itself. Now it seems to me that Euclid rejects, as most people would, the kind of causality where things at a spooky distance change because some unrelated thing moved or acted. And this may seem like good common sense, but it's worth pointing out that the kind of causality being rejected is the kind of causality exercised by a deity in schemes of particular providence. This kind of causality is also found in certain interpretations of quantum mechanics. And this is also similar to the way in which Heidegger indicates that certain modes of being only show themselves to human beings who are in the proper moods, Befindlichkeiten. I mention these examples to show that it's not impossible to think the world is more like what is given to us by sight than that, than that it is like the stable, independent, true geometry that Euclid seems to prefer. And further, causality does not have to be thought of as something that happens only between objects that touch each other. So what we have looked at here in the optics then would seem to raise questions, such as whether Euclid is ontologically committed to a certain kind of causality, and with it certain kinds of beings and certain modes of being. Is Euclid committed to a certain kind of scientific outlook on the world, one that carries with it a certain kind of natural theology, one that would only allow certain kinds of deities? These kinds of questions may not come up frequently or urgently in most encounters with Euclid's elements, but they are absolutely provoked by the repeated distinction between appearance and reality in the optics. It may thus prove to be the case that studying the optics reveals much to us about Euclid's commitments and about the grounds of those commitments. And it may also prove to be the case that the optics can help us learn to read Euclid's proofs better. By better I mean in such a way as to investigate those underlying things that Euclid thinks about deeply 
but is not trying to prove to us in his texts. Thank you.